had the great Paul Leach operating. I don't know whether he lit it as well, but tremendous, you know, the gentleman of the film business was Paul. And he'd come back from Canada and he could cover. He knew, he knew how to shoot things so they'd cut. So that part of it was pretty easy. I mean, most of the time then the schedules were pretty tight. And, and you were, if they got the day, you were happy. It was processed by Colour Film in Australia and we got the print like with three days to go or four days to go, threw it on the wall and I think one of the Moodaby brothers was there and it was a stop down on what I'd seen in Australia because I'd checked the print. And I, was, and I looked and, and it was brown and I went, Christ, what's happening? Will this projector not throw far enough? And it was the best we could get. And, and I asked to put the house lights on and the screen was brown. And I said to, uh, to whichever mood be it was, hey, can we paint the screen? And he went, yeah, feel free. And about an hour later he came back and said, oh no, don't paint the screen because the, the speaker's behind it and you'll fill up the holes and we won't be able to hear anything. So no, you can't paint the screen. And, and John Reed swears he didn't know this. I, I don't know whether he did or not, but I rang up for another print at a stop, a stop brighter across across it and then it played as about how it should have played but it was a pretty scary way to have to do it. Alan Bollinger shot it and I know it looked beautiful but we had no depth of field. It was like that so focus became a really big issue and together John Lang who'd also worked in Canada, he, he'd come back, he'd been an editor so he knew how to put a, he knew where to put the legs. And, and that was useful. The thing I remember is what great tradecraft David Hemmings had. He just was so slick in how he hit his marks, how he could turn where you would go. You cannot turn that way to talk to someone over there. He could do it without, without the focal plane changing. He was just so stylish. Um, and all that stuff was second nature to him, and it was nice to work with. I think there was an editor on before me, I, I know who it was, but I never saw him there, and Jeff was unhappy. And it was Davey Huggett. And, and so I think Dave went, and I got on it, and I went, I'll do it, but I'm not going to do it unless I've got a clean print. So effectively, you know, I did it. Off, a, off a, a fresh start. But the dynamic is pretty much like it always is. I, the only difference being I'm an early riser and Jeff's a late riser. So he'd be in, his, in the treehouse sleeping. You can't get him to bed or out of bed. And he really objected to me throwing rocks on the roof at nine o'clock in the morning. He didn't like it, but, but he sucked it up, which was good of him. Quite Earth was I found a really interesting picture. It, um, we worried that um, Bruno wouldn't be able to hold it, hold it for 40 minutes, which he has to do. So it was, it was shot in modular fashion, so that at any time, if Bruno fell apart, you could go, we've got eight blocks, we'll throw away one and see if it improves. If it doesn't, we'll throw away two. Now, in actual fact, he had no problem with it. It was interesting. He wasn't the greatest guy on scientific terms. Bruno, that's not his bag, but he got away with it. And, and he certainly carried the picture. It's a weird film because you, you, you know, the audience will go away thinking, well, what happened at 612? And we did what we could. We put in another flashback to go, right, does that make it, does that make more sense of it? And I can remember thinking, you know, will they, will they, will they not um, get this picture? It, for me, it's uh, if they don't, um, Jeffrey, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and uh, let's make it not boring. <laughs> let's, if, if they don't get it, let's not bore them. Lee Tamahori's first picture, 
Um, he was an extremely good commercial director. He was, however, hamstrung with a very small budget. I think it might have been two, three. And so every penny was shaved. It was shot on somewhere between 60 and 70,000 feet of print I had. So you could, put, you could pick, pick a two, two arm loads to a car and you had the movie. Two producers who will remain nameless were asked by the Film Commission to, uh, to advise, and I think they got paid a pretty penny to advise, and they said um, the ratio should be 10 to 1 that it should be shot on 16. Now, Lee had shot all his commercials on 35. He wasn't going to shoot anything on 16. And, and so he went, give us a look at the budget, and he massaged the budget into him having 35, and I think he had to shoot it on 6 to 1 to make it work. And he did. And he didn't print all of that. Um, he most probably printed... He would have printed 70% of it. But there was not a lot of film and not a lot of choice. The Ned Cutter Cutter mistakenly made a, a, a blue, just cut where there was no cut, misread a number. We didn't have another take. We actually had to make one up in the Oxbury. We had to fix the, physically make a frame from, from the frame before and the frame after. Stick it through the Oxbury and make a half ad mix to create the frame that the Ned Cutter had mistakenly cut. So there wasn't much. There wasn't much to come and go on on that picture, but it was it was enjoyable. Yeah, it was an enjoyable job. Two Towers was just like all the others, except many many times bigger. It was it was a three year operation for me. Um, it was meant to be cut simultaneously with Picture One, but after about a month. Pete realised that he was peddling as hard as he could just to get picture one done. So two got thrown in a pile in a way. I'd go and see Rushes. Um, there, there wasn't a great deal of point because he's got a very good memory, but he couldn't remember two pictures that were shooting two and a half million feet of time. So we tended to go over it the following year when he got it done. If I had a gripe, it's generally, we never had four days off at the end. We didn't seem to be able to afford to cut the picture for a year, which we did, and then not take the weekend of Monday and Tuesday off and go, right, we'll run this thing and see if we can get away, with, away from it for four days. We never, we'd sort of, we'd be at it and at it and at it, and they'd, we gave it up. We gave it up real at a time from memory, we gave him real one, that'll shut him up. And that's how it went. But it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. We, we did the odd 26 hour day in London. And we were putting people on concords with, with a copy and go, if you're going with that, we've got to run it. We can't spot check it, you can't. <laughs> so you'd keep them up. And if, if they couldn't hear anything, you would make the changes at three in the morning. So we worked, it was, it was a fun job. He works a different way to all the others. Mostly, mostly I'd worked with people in a collaborative sense. Pete is the ultimate auteur. You, you know, you make his picture. He could, he could make his own effects if there was enough time in the day. He's got a SGI thing that will make dinosaurs. It's just only 24 hours, so he can't. But he's certainly capable of it. Um, it was good fun. He, he's pleasant to work with. Um, he led from the front. I got, you know, I have most probably had one bad day in three years working for him, and that wasn't his fault. That was other people um, cause, causing me to waste a day, which I don't like. Um, but it, but generally, it was good. We cut it here. We went to the, we went to England and cut while while he. Did the music at Abbey Road. We waltzed down there and watched it go down. Um, we had a week off in Europe and came back here and had a machine down at the film unit um, in case he wanted to make a change. And we sat around and sure enough, he found 17 frames. It was the last cut we ever made. And that was while it was being mixed. So, you know, that's Pete.